Hey guys, this is Jess. So Halloween is coming up this week, so I thought it might be fun to read you a story. This is Bear River, which is a short, uh, kind of romantic horror story that I wrote last year. This originally appeared in The Stranger Horror Anthology, Volume 1. This is Bear River by Jessica Kale. Cassie dropped her forehead against the fluorescent blue face of the pop machine as the bill reader rejected her crumpled dollar for the fifth time. It was 4.55 a.m., and though the beige break room was bright enough to read an x-ray, she needed her second Mountain Dew to trick her brain into thinking her hours were natural. The soft buzz pulsating above her eyebrows was almost comforting, a little harmless white noise to interrupt the oppressive silence of the night. There was nothing natural about her shift pattern. Winter in Minnesota, she rose after dark and slept when the sun came up, one of two LPNs working the graveyard shift at Bear River Assisted Living. She got paid an extra dollar an hour for her trouble, and that had made it worth it in the beginning. After all, she had student loans to pay off. Seven years of night shifts later, it was that extra dollar she'd watched in her scrubs until Washington had come out soft and faded, more of a harried Walt Whitman than the commander of the Continental Army. The ticking of the oversized clock echoed across the linoleum, propelling her a little closer to the end of her smoke break with every deafening snap. A faint whirring invaded the rhythm, like an insect buzzing from another room. A red light glared at her from the corner beside the microwave. Who had left the radio on? She turned the dial up three notches. The residents were all sleeping, and most would have their hearing aids out. If she kept it low, they wouldn't hear it. That's what this shift needs. More cowbell. Cassie smiled to no one in particular and sang along as she tried to smooth out her dollar on the counter. She tapped her foot and shook her ass. There was no one to see her. The song was a bit before her time, maybe, but every radio station in the state seemed to be permanently stuck in 1987, so she had grown up with Blue Oyster Cult and Kansas. She punched the air as the machine finally took her dollar and the balance appeared on the little black screen. She smacked the button automatically, the worn plastic the only evidence of her nightly habit. Well, that and her triglycerides. Sky high, though she'd always maintained a healthy weight in spite of a diet that consisted almost entirely of Mountain Dew, Cheetos, and Marlboro Lights. She twisted the cap off the bottle and poured it over the half-melted ice in her BPA-free Slytherin cup. That first hit of neon caffeine was magical. She took a second and popped her nightly vitamin D capsule, her first and only defense against rickets, as the song's final strains wound their way into the morning. She shut off the radio as she recognized the opening to the Metallica cover of Turn the Page for only the 500,000th time since she'd graduated high school. That's quite enough of that, she muttered as she slipped out the side door. The snow was finally melting, but the night was still cold as hell. She zipped her fleece-lined hoodie up to her chin and lit a cigarette with shaking hands. The parking lot was quiet as the nursing home, the streetlights casting huge orange ellipses over the old cars too rusty to be considered classic. Her own piece-of-shit Pontiac was a few spaces from the door beside Marissa's pickup. It had been a particularly savage winter, and the salt on the roads had eaten the edges of the hole in the floor until she could see the potholes the city denied having beneath the brake pedal as she swerved to miss them. It wasn't much of a view. She leaned against the door and looked at the river, all black and shining beyond the trees. Cassie caught a hint of movement in her peripheral vision, and her gaze snapped back to the parking lot. One of the residents had gotten out and was walking away as fast as his compression socks would take him. Shit. She dropped her cigarette in the snow. Mr. Anderson? Mr. Anderson, is that you? As she ran toward him, she realized he wasn't alone. He was walking with a much younger man. She skidded through the dirty snow, her breath billowing like smoke from the ironworks across the lake. What are you doing out of bed? Breakfast isn't for another three hours. She touched his arm, and he was colder than she was, wearing nothing but his monogram pajamas. He smiled at her gently. I'm going to miss my train. My friend here is taking me to the station. In your pajamas? She looked at his friend, and all rational thought stopped. He looked young, but oddly ageless, with eyes like the moon. 
bright, beautiful, and cold. He wore a dusty dark coat and a fair isle sweater. She softened. Surely no psychopath would abduct an elderly man while wearing something as dorky as a fair isle sweater. Her amusement left her as she met his gaze. The night seemed to darken around them as he regarded her with something like compassion. It was tangible, that gaze. She could feel it. It felt like an embrace. It felt like the perfect relief of total oblivion. We're going to be late, dear. Cassie shook her head to snap herself out of the peculiar hypnosis of the stranger's gaze. Mr. Anderson had no luggage, but he'd struggle carrying it himself. Perhaps it was already loaded into the car. Of course. Where are you going? We're going to see my family, he grinned. How nice, she replied with genuine warmth. How great would it be to have a family you were excited to see? She glanced again at the stranger. And this is your son? He's just a friend. Was a 90-year-old man likely to have a friend in his 30s? She knew Mr. Anderson had a touch of dementia. The man was probably a son or a grandson. Nephew, maybe. Again, she met those eyes. I'm Cassie. He gave her an enigmatic smile. I know. Mr. Anderson took her hand and kissed her knuckles. You're a great nurse, sweetheart. I'll miss you. Give my cookies to Gavin and don't let Martha steal my Ativan. She likes it too much. He rolled his eyes. You take care now. Cassie smiled and waved. Have fun, Mr. A. I'll see you two when you get back. He laughed. <laughs> Not if I can help it. The stranger held her gaze for a moment longer than strictly necessary before he turned and helped Mr. Anderson over the packed snow that covered the lot. Cassie returned to the side door to grab her cup, her cheeks a little warmer than they had been before. Good Lord, but he was beautiful. Working the hours she did, she seldom got to meet family members. With any luck, he'd bring Mr. Anderson back while she was working. Obviously, it would be a HIPAA violation to scour his chart for details. But would it be totally unethical to slip him her number if he came back? Her sigh sounded disappointed even to her. <sighs> yes, Cassie. Yes, it would. She walked down a long corridor of dark, open rooms on her way back to the big round desk she shared with Marissa, the other night nurse. The desk, or pod, as it was officially called in a creepy, soylent green kind of way, was situated in the center of the four main hallways, as if a spaceship full of outdated office equipment had landed right on the crossroads of the facility and had decided to stay. Marissa was standing behind the desk, the phone receiver wedged between her shoulder and her cheek. She raised her eyebrows as if to ask why Cassie was late, but resumed her conversation. Yes, just now. They haven't been notified. Cassie shrugged off her coat and dropped into her swivel chair. She slurped her soda and checked her task list for the morning. Just a few more charts and it would be time to get the morning's medications ready. He's in the chapel. I didn't want to alarm his roommate. Her ears perked up, expecting to hear the flu had come back again. Every year it came like clockwork, once in September, then again in March to get the rest. Containment was crucial. Yes, right away. I did everything I could. Thank you. Cassie resisted the urge to roll her eyes. Marissa was all right, but she did have a bit of a martyr complex. Not the worst quality in a nurse, but she doubted her motivations were purely altruistic. That woman lived for praise. Marissa hung up the phone and sat back down with a sigh. Where were you? Sorry, I saw Mr. Anderson in the parking lot and I thought he escaped. Did you get a look at his son when he signed in? Marissa blinked, her usually placid stare hardening into something more hostile. Are you messing with me? Messing with her? Cassie shook her head. No. Why? Mr. Anderson's been dead for 20 minutes. If she hadn't been sitting, she would have fallen over. But, but I just saw him. She swallowed hard. Five minutes ago, if that. His son? That's not funny, Cassie. Her heart rate sped up at the accusation. Look, I swear to God, I just saw him. He said... 
She felt the blood drain from her face. He... He said to give his cookies to Gavin and don't let Martha steal us out of Anne. Marissa cracked a smile. That does sound like him. Gavin didn't even wake up when I rolled him out. The body's in the chapel now. They'll be here to pick it up in half an hour. Cassie frowned. Was Marissa pulling her leg? They'd worked together for years and she'd never seemed to have such a dark sense of humor. Well, who was the other guy then? Did you see an angel? Marissa asked hopefully, clutching the little gold cross she wore around her neck. I mean, he sure looked like one. <laughs> I don't know. She pulled up Mr. Anderson's chart automatically and checked his power of attorney and next of kin. He has two daughters, Julia and Sarah. No mention of a son. Marissa clapped her hands together, her eyes bright. Maybe he was dead too. Did he look dead? <laughs> what does dead look like? No, but neither did Mr. Anderson. Did he have wings? Cassie snorted. <laughs> no, he was just a guy. I mean, a stupidly hot guy, but just a guy. She thought of all the angels she'd read about and seen on TV. Angels don't always have wings, you know. Of course they do. If he didn't have wings, he was something else. Cassie had almost forgotten her touched by an angel moment a week later when Evelyn Taylor's alarm went off at 2.45. It wasn't her heart monitor, but the shrill, ear-shredding siren of the motion detector that went off every time a resident tried to get out of bed without assistance. She was most likely just trying to use the restroom, but the alarm would scream at full volume until Cassie manually turned it off. She sprinted down the east hallway until she reached the last door on the right, cursing under her breath. All she needed was for the noise to wake up the whole building, and then she'd be plugging the alarms back in until the sun came up. Mrs. Taylor was standing when Cassie arrived, pale as a wraith in the darkness of her room. Cassie flipped on a light. Her paper-thin skin had a grayish tinge, and she wasn't wearing her oxygen. She plugged the wire back into the alarm, and the horrible sound instantly stopped. As if there was any chance the rest of the wing hadn't woken up, Cassie kept her voice low. Your oxygen came off, Mrs. T. Can I put it back on for you? Mrs. Taylor waved a hand. Do you need to use the restroom? She shook her head, her white hair sleep rumpled. No. Cassie frowned. She'd have to check her chart to see if any of her meds had caused insomnia later. Okay, um, can we get you back into bed? Mrs. Taylor was tired. That was clear enough. Cassie tucked her back into bed slipped her nasal cannula around her ears and put the soft plastic prongs into her nose. She checked the settings on her oxygen concentrator and found them exactly where they were supposed to be at two liters per minute. Mrs. Taylor must have pulled off the tubing in her sleep. Cassie turned off the light and waited by her bedside until she heard the shallow, rhythmic wheezing that told her Mrs. Taylor was asleep. The sound was so calming she could have drifted off herself. It would feel so good to sit in the armchair for just five, maybe ten minutes. Marissa wouldn't miss her, would she? She'd been so tired lately. Her hair stood on end as a particular awareness settled into her bones. She couldn't sit in the armchair because someone else was already there. She took a steadying breath and turned. There was no one there. The room was perfectly quiet except for Mrs. Taylor's shallow breathing and the faint rails that Cassie could hear even without a stethoscope. If that sound hadn't helped her to quit smoking, nothing would. Still, it wasn't that putting her on edge. The night felt like it was charged with a peculiar electricity, as though the darkness itself was sentient and aware of her encroaching on its territory. She turned to leave and gasped as Mrs. Taylor's smooth, cool hand clutched hers. Cassie's heart slammed into her ribs as though it was trying to break out. Uh, do you need the bathroom, Mrs. Taylor? The old woman barely opened her eyes. Who is that man? A nervous giggle escaped Cassie's throat. Uh, <laughs> you mean Gary, who takes you to breakfast? Not Gary, she wheezed. The new one. Handsome. Gary was the newest man working there. 
What does he look like? Well, look at him, she demanded impatiently. He's sitting right there. Nope, 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 nope. Cassie's first impulse was to book it back to the pod, but her feet felt glued to the ground. She let all of her breath out at once when she realized she'd been holding it. Calm the fuck down. Mrs. Taylor is 87 and she has dementia. She's just confused. She looked back at the chair again, and she saw no one. It was just a dream, she said, as much to comfort herself as Mrs. Taylor. There's no one there. He'll come back. Mrs. Taylor's eyes were closed now, and her grip loosened on Cassie's hand. Mrs. Taylor slept as peacefully as a child with the confidence that she was safe. Cassie hadn't slept like that in years. Had she ever? Living alone, some part of her was always listening for intruders. There was no one to watch over her as she slept except for the supernatural posters she'd had on her wall since nursing school. It must be nice to know for certain no harm would come to you in your sleep. That certainly hadn't been her experience. Proud to be that person watching over Mrs. Taylor, Cassie's bravery returned. She tucked the soft pink blanket around Mrs. Taylor's frail shoulders. On impulse, she kissed the woman's forehead, though she was strictly prohibited from doing so. She felt the need to comfort her for some reason, and there's no one there to see, except for the empty chair. Cassie almost laughed at her nerves. She didn't turn around, though. Cassie closed her eyes against the migraine forming at the base of her skull. Her nerves were already standing on end from the creepy vibe she'd gotten in Mrs. Taylor's room, and every minute sound felt like a fingernail prodding her brain. The fluorescent light buzzed overhead like a particularly insistent fly, a subtle droning that seemed to intensify the plastic ticking of the huge clock and the slide of the pages of Marissa's latest issue of Entertainment Weekly. She gripped her pen so hard she thought it would break. When she opened her eyes, she gasped. She had left the pen on Mrs. Taylor's chart when she had closed her eyes, and the ink had bled a huge black spot onto the medication's log. Shit, she muttered under her breath as she reached for the correction tape. Linda's going to love that. Marissa swiveled toward her, but she barely glanced up from her magazine. Huh? My pen exploded on this chart, Cassie explained it away. She didn't want it to sound like she'd fallen asleep on the job. Bummer, Marissa sighed. She'll probably want you to fill out a new one. Great. Their manager was happy enough to leave them to their own devices, but fixated on a handful of obsessions, chief among them clean paperwork. You're probably right. She grabbed a clean log from the drawer between their desks. Marissa put down her magazine and reached for the new log. I'll do it. Isn't it your lunch suit? Five minutes. Are you sure you don't mind? She shrugged. Happy to help. Besides, I could use something to do. Gassy frowned. Marissa was always first to take on extra tasks, but she hated paperwork. It wasn't like her to volunteer to do more. Still, it was no secret she'd been gunning for a promotion. Cassie shrugged it off. Yeah, okay. Thanks a lot. Marissa smiled and clicked her mechanical pencil. No problem. Why don't you head out now? You look like you could use a do. She nodded toward Cassie's cup. <laughs> yeah, a do and some light trepanation. Thanks. Don't mention it. Cassie slumped toward the break room, the oppressive silence deepening with every stride. She was still on edge, but even her own overactive imagination was preferable to the hundred and one irritations that surrounded her at her desk. The hallway split into three, the east and west sides splayed like arms flanking the shorter south corridor. They were almost identical except for the name tags beside the open doors and the decorations the residents' families had pinned to them. A wreath here, a kindergarten drawing there. Mrs. Hart's goth granddaughter had even taped a stuffed Count doll from Sesame Street to her door. Seeing all the love left behind usually made Cassie smile, but tonight it was too much. The air was stagnant and stale, with a scent of saltine crackers and pepper packets spilled and never recovered from the burgundy berber carpet. The walls seemed to breathe with the sound of a hundred heart monitors and oxygen concentrators. They were alive and advancing on her. If she didn't get out of here, they'd crush her. 
She almost jumped out of her skin as the elevator opened. Fuck, she cursed. There was no one inside it. There was never anyone inside it. The elevator was a relic from the building's construction in the 60s, and everyone said it had a mind of its own. It only went down to the basement, where they stored extra supplies and broken furniture, so no one ever used it anymore. Still, it moved by itself and opened its doors, whether anyone had called it or not. Linda had assured her it was an automatic feature built in to keep it in working order. It was still creepy as hell. Cassie stopped in the break room only long enough to grab her can of pop from the fridge. She charged into the cold with her coat thrown over her shoulder, needing fresh air more than food or even warmth. She didn't feel the bite of the wind off the river until after she'd lit her cigarette and sat down on the back porch. Her hands shook as she pulled the tab on her pop can. Hypothermia is just going to make you crazier, she muttered to herself, cigarette clamped between lips quickly going numb. She pulled on her coat and poured the pop into her cup, then took a noisy sip. Why do you do that? At the sound of another voice, Cassie sat bolt upright. He was a shadow under the streetlight, but she couldn't mistake him. Marissa's words of foreboding came back to her and made her hair stand on end. If he doesn't have wings, he's something else. Do what? Pour it into a second cup. In her surprise, she had forgotten she was holding the drink. I don't know, I guess it feels like it's healthier. It's not, he said easily enough, not bothering to elaborate. May I join you? She knew she should be afraid, but he looked like a normal guy from a distance. Maybe he had been related to Mr. Anderson after all. Maybe he was some kind of TV psychic that helped the dead move on or some other such crap. Either way, he didn't feel like someone she should fear. Yeah, be my guest. The night itself seemed to follow him as he walked toward her, the inky sky wrapped around him like an indigo cape. He was tall and lean, all angles and sharp edges like a broken umbrella. Cassie exhaled through the corner of her mouth. She didn't want anything blocking her view. He was more than a man and somehow less. She watched him with unblinking eyes, transfixed the way she might be if seeing uncharted beauty for the first time. An angel? Oh no. A devil? Too limiting. He was something more than a single entity, something bigger, eternal. He felt like the universe, the proverbial void. Now that she was staring into the void, she found she couldn't look away. He gazed back, the cosmos in his eyes. The cigarette fell from her lips, but she caught it before it hit the snow. She took a long drag, flustered. What did one say to the universe? She offered him a cigarette as he sat beside her. He took it. Cassie flipped the top off her Zippo and lit it for him. He cupped his hands around the light to protect it from the wind and inhaled like someone who had been smoking for a very long time. You got a name, Fair Isle? He pushed a shock of black hair out of his face and let his head drop back against the wall. I got a few. He didn't volunteer any of them, though. She tried and failed to pull her gaze away. Did Mr. Anderson get where he was going? He raised his eyebrows in lieu of a nod. His wife was happy to see him. She was there at the station with his dog. Her heart lurched as an involuntary flash of tears filled her eyes. They froze on her cheeks before she could wipe them away. Good, she sniffed. What are you doing back here? I'm here all the time, he said as though it was nothing. More, recently. Don't you find that odd? She blinked, unsure of what he was asking. Well, I've never seen you. Right. He inhaled a plume of smoke into the air. Odd. The hinges squeaked as the door swung open and Marissa popped her head out. Cassie, are you talking to someone? Yeah, this is... He looked at her inquisitively as Marissa stared at her over his head. This is... He chuckled under his breath. Hey, Marissa. Still, she gave no indication of seeing him. 
He was well over six feet tall and looked like the world's sexiest vampire. He really couldn't be missed. A chill ran down her spine that had nothing to do with the sub-freezing temperature. Maybe Marissa couldn't see him. Are you feeling all right? Marissa asked, bending over his lap. She plucked the half-smoked cigarette right out of his hand and passed it to Cassie. You dropped this in the snow. Wait, were you smoking too? Oh, Jesus, Cassie muttered. Um, I don't know where my brain is tonight. I was just trying to say that this is my sister's birthday, and I was leaving her a message for when she wakes up. I'm fine. Cassie didn't have a sister. Okay. Marissa looked at her oddly. I guess I'll see you in a few. See ya. Cassie flicked the butt of her cigarette into the snow and popped his half-smoked one into her mouth so as to not look as crazy as she felt. Marissa closed the door before Cassie fell. The instant his cigarette touched her lips, she felt like she had been ripped out of her body. She shot through space at such a speed that all matter seemed to form a tunnel around her. It was not space as she had imagined it, dark and empty with a few distant stars, but an endless plain too vast to comprehend, filled with blinding light, beautiful colors, and the heady smell of countless flowers. Music came from every direction, thousands of sounds from every imaginable instrument colliding as stars burst before her eyes. She stretched her arms into it with joyous anticipation until she hit what felt like the end of her tether, and she fell, and fell, and fell. She hit the porch so hard it felt like she dented it, her heart hammering as if it had been jolted back to life with a defibrillator. The man leaned over her, concern in his eyes. He held her in his arms like he had caught her when she had landed. His long black coat shrouded them both, and she felt warm and very peaceful. His cigarette was gone, but she could still taste eternity on her lips. Is that how it feels to kiss you? She asked, breathless. I don't know, he said, looking a little stunned. <laughs> no one ever has. Cassie smiled. Angel, devil, Bigfoot, she didn't care what he was as long as she got to do that again. She went in for a kiss. He pulled away. Not yet. She fell back against his arms, disappointed. Not yet? Not yet, he repeated. He stood and offered her a hand to help her up. She took his hand and climbed to her feet on shaking legs. Why couldn't Marissa see you? Most people can't. He shook the snow off of his coat and pulled a pocket watch out of it. Who are you? She asked, desperate to know. What are you doing here? The answers to those questions are the same. He tucked the watch back into his coat. For now, I suppose I'm taking a break, just like you. The answers to those questions are the same. Cassie didn't have to maul his riddle. She was pretty sure she knew who he was. Blue Oyster Cult popped into her head, the song she'd been singing in the break room days before. Is it still 40,000 a day? He met her gaze with surprise, but she could tell he knew exactly what she meant. Uh, it's, um, it's closer to 150,000 now. She searched his face for a lie and found none. A lot's changed in 40 years. Not as much as you think. He almost smiled. I'm surprised you ever get a break. She tucked her hair behind her ear. Oh, Lord. She was literally flirting with death. They don't last long. He apologized softly. I need to go. Wait, she called as he turned away. When will I see you again? He smiled at last, a kind of glimmer of light in the darkness. Soon. As the door closed behind him, she realized too late he was going into the nursing home. Shit, she cursed and ran after him into the hall. He was nowhere to be seen. She jogged back through the hall and past the break room to the central stretch with their pod at the middle. Where was he? Marissa sat behind the desk, 
looking down at something in her lap, presumably her magazine. Everything seemed to be exactly as she had left it. The elevator door opened. Cassie jumped with a yelp, her heart kicking into high gear. As always, there was no one there. White as a ghost, her reflection stared back at her from the mirror inside. Behind her in the glass, a hint of a man appeared yards away in the east hallway and dissipated like a wisp of dark smoke. She turned around and saw nothing. Mrs. Taylor, she muttered to herself and charged down the hall to the residence room. She flipped on the lights without thinking twice, only to find Mrs. Taylor sleeping soundly in her bed, much as Cassie had left her. Cassie braced herself against the door jamb to ca catch her breath. Had she imagined it all? The man? His cigarette? The universe? Had she finally lost her mind? As her breath slowed, she heard what was missing from the room. No wheezing. No rails. Dread made her steps heavy as she crossed the room to check on Mrs. Taylor. She had passed away in her sleep, and she was smiling. Cassie sighed. She loved her residence, and it was never easy when one of them passed. Still, she remembered what she had seen and wondered who would be waiting for Mrs. Taylor on the other side. Would he hold her like he had held Cassie? Or would he just take her hand? She whispered to the corpse. Lucky. By the time Cassie made it home, it was nearly ten. The midwinter sun reflecting off the snowbanks cast the town in an almost nuclear glow, far too bright for the night she'd had. All she wanted in life was a solid eight hours cocooned in blackout blinds. She adjusted her sunglasses and threw her bag over her shoulder. Two spaces down, a new Nissan beeped as Andy from 2A turned on his keyless entry from the top of the stairs. Must be nice, Cassie muttered to herself as she manually locked her rust bucket. She held up her keychain and squeezed it like an automatic key fob. Pew, pew. Hey, Cassie. Startled, she turned to find Andy from 2A smiling at her. His perfect 100 megawatt teeth turned what might have been a polite smile into a blinding grin worthy of HDTV. Cassie yawned. <sighs> Morning. He didn't seem to be in any particular hurry to move along. The longer he waited, the warmer his car would be. He thrust his hands into the pocket of his coat. Hey, I was wondering. He looked at his feet, bashful for a man of thirty-odd. Feeling awkward, Cassie pushed her sunglasses to the top of her head. When he looked up, no doubt he'd see the circles under her eyes and run the other way. Yeah? He didn't. You, uh, you want to get a drink later? Or something? She blinked, more stunned by Andy from 2A asking her out than she had been to share a smoke break with Death. Andy was handsome as a Ken doll, tall, blonde, and athletic in an all-American kind of way that had its roots in Scandinavia. Her first instinct was to make an excuse, but there was no good reason to refuse. He had always been kind to her and gave off a harmless, Dudley-do-right kind of vibe. He'd probably been an Eagle Scout, for God's sake. Everything looked very different by the light of day. The world outside the nursing home was one she no longer recognized. She felt no connection to it. She was clearly going crazy. What if she was already crazy? Had she imagined it? Whether or not she had met and tried to make out with death, Andy from 2A looked uh, real enough, and he was still waiting for her answer. Sure, she said, talking herself into it. Yeah, that'd be nice. After they had exchanged numbers and made tentative plans to meet at Chester's at 8, Cassie slumped up the stairs to her apartment. She kicked off her boots, shrugged out of her coat, and dropped her bag onto the couch. The weariness she felt in her bones made even changing into her pajamas a Herculean task. Cassie didn't climb into bed so much as she just stopped standing. She landed on her back, surrounded by a mountain of pillows. The Winchester boys seemed to commiserate from the poster on the wall. She hadn't been on a date in a year. She should be excited. Especially because Andy from 2A had kind of a Dean Winchester thing going on. 
Her friends from nursing school would have climbed him like a tree. Shame she'd always been a Castiel kind of girl. She pulled a pillow over her face and screamed into it. What did you get to drink? Cassie looked up from her orange cocktail at the question. Andy from 2A, or just Andy, allegedly, grinned at her from over his beer. Oh, I, uh, I forget what it's called. Something to do with medicine. It's whiskey, lemon, and ginger. To illustrate the point, she pulled a long stick of candied ginger from her glass. He flipped through the menu. The penicillin? Yeah, that sounds right, though it seems like jumping the gun to name a cocktail after something that cures venereal disease. He didn't laugh. Nurse joke, she muttered and sipped her drink. It tasted great, but it wasn't nearly strong enough for her tonight. I'm sorry I'm not really with it. I think I'm still waking up. Long shift? She nodded. Yeah, longer than usual. Plus, it's not every day you die for a minute. I had to stay late for a meeting. Linda, that is, my boss, she thinks somebody's stealing meds. He frowned. Do you know who it is? No idea. Then again, I only work nights, so I don't really know any of the day staff. So what, like, opiates? Oxy? Cassie smiled into her drink. You sound like you know your drugs. He shrugged. I am a cop. She could have smacked her head at her stupidity. She knew that. He'd just been telling her about it for the last 20 minutes. Right. Uh, do you see a lot of that? His eyes widened as though his job still had the ability to shock him. More than I'd like to. You'd think it was just a big city thing, but it's everywhere. Even in a nice place like this. <laughs> nice place. Cassie let out a long breath and wondered how soon she could take a smoke break without being rude. That's awful, she said, because it felt like the right thing to say. It's fentanyl that's missing. Fentanyl, he repeated, stunned. A hundred times stronger than morphine fentanyl. She stirred her drink with the ginger. Is there any other kind? He gave a low whistle. What are you guys doing with that? It gets ordered for chronic pain, usually related to cancer. Very small doses. Wow. Hey, I'll let you know if I hear of anyone selling it. Maybe you can find the guy that way. She looked up at him, genuinely surprised he'd care. Then again, it was his job. Thanks, Andy. He smiled at her, and his eyes were just blue. Dinner was perfectly pleasant, though she felt barely present for most of it. Andy from 2A was a great guy with a great job and a great smile and really great biceps. She should have been looking at those. God knew every other woman in the bar was. But her gaze kept returning to the window behind his head. Christmas lights lit up the plaza and the road beyond. Cars slid through the snow a couple dozen a minute on Friday night. A crash was inevitable. Was it so awful to hope her spooky new friend would save her from a perfectly pleasant date? She had never wished death on anyone before, but now that she knew what it was, who he was, she wondered if it would be such a bad thing to do. The people passing by were happy and more than a little drunk, enjoying the night with their friends. They all had things to live for, relationships, parties, great hair, and they would all be missed if they died. But Cassie was a different story. Nobody would notice she was gone. Maybe not even Andy and Tue. If death wasn't coming on his own, could she bring him to her? Are you okay? Cassie met Andy's concerned gaze over the last of the fries. Oh, I'm, I'm sorry. I haven't been feeling well this week. I, I think I might be coming down with something. He closed his hand over hers across the table. Do you want to go home? He meant their apartment building, but when she thought of home, she saw the cosmos hurtling past her to the sound of a thousand instruments playing hundreds of songs. I think that would be best. Can we try again next week? After they'd paid, they walked out across the plaza toward the parking ramp on the other side of the street. By night, the dozens of bronze doves that formed the fountain looked like darker birds, and again, she thought of him. A shadow, a crow, a crooked silhouette. She'd never met anyone like him, and she wondered if she ever would again. She still wanted that kiss. Not yet, 
he'd said. It was a promise, she felt it. It sat uneasily between comfort and frustration, inflamed by bottomless lust. She wanted to see him again, wanted to feel that comfort in his arms. She wanted that kiss now. She looked for him everywhere, down the alleyways and in the darkened doorways. Seeing nothing, she stepped out into traffic. Jesus! Andy from 2A caught the back of her jacket and pulled her out of the path of an oncoming bus. Are you okay? I'm fine. I, um, I didn't see it coming, she lied. Thanks. He hugged her close and she could feel his heart racing in his sculpted chest. Hers was far too slow for someone who'd almost been hit by a bus. Weighed down by disappointment, it felt like it had already stopped. The lock popped softly into place, followed by the dull thud of Cassie's head hitting the back of the door. Andy had kissed her, and she hadn't felt a thing. A hand placed respectfully on the small of her back, lips that demanded nothing. He smelled like sunlight, some tasteful cologne marketed toward athletic men in sticky pull-out ads in GQ. It was meant to smell like desire or superiority or aspiration or something, but it was so inoffensive it smelled like nothing at all. Marissa inhaled those ads. Years ago, she'd bought a bottle and sprayed her pillowcases with it so she could pretend she had a boyfriend. Now a real, live men with biceps smelling of materialism by Calvin Klein was on the other side of that door, just a few steps down the hallway. A couple of yards and a knock, and she could be smelling it on his pillow in the morning. She popped the ball into the door chain and slid it into place. Cassie kicked off her shoes and slumped into her bedroom in the dark. She'd only been awake maybe four hours, but she felt her eyes closing again, not bothering to take her dress off. She flopped into bed. She closed her eyes for a moment. When she opened them again, the clock read 4.55. Cassie stared at it with a grimace. The green numbers blurred and swayed before her eyes. Her heart hammered erratically as if fighting something. What? Her chest felt heavy and very still, as if weighed down by dozens of blankets. The room spun and her heart kicked. Something was wrong. Why had she woken up? She wasn't breathing. Cassie opened her mouth and inhaled so fast and hard her lungs ached. She sat up in bed, pressed two fingers into the artery in her neck and felt for her pulse. It fluttered rapidly, more the frantic flutter of wings than the pace of a human heart. How had she stopped breathing? She exhaled slowly, trying to calm it down. Her lungs relaxed, as if going to sleep inside her body. It would have been easy to let them. Cassie had to consciously force herself to breathe in again. What is going on? She muttered to herself in the dark. Odd that, the darkness answered. Every hair in her body stood on end. She was not alone. A tall, shadowy figure sat in her only chair, long limbs folded awkwardly in the confined space. The pale orange glow of the streetlight outside cut through the dingy blinds to illuminate the smile playing at the corner of his mouth. The rest of his face was dark. Death sat at the foot of her bed. She should be afraid, but all she could think about was how wet she was. Arr! Her voice cracked. Her throat was so dry it felt desiccated, as though she'd swallowed a pine cone or a cheese grater. She licked her lips. Are you here for me? I was, he answered quietly. You woke up. She stretched her legs toward him, languid with an unfamiliar heaviness, as if she'd taken a particularly good muscle relaxant. You got somewhere to be? His mouth twitched into a smirk. About a hundred and fifty thousand somewheres, as it happens. I should go. Stay. He didn't move. She didn't need to see his eyes to feel them on her, warming her skin sure as any caress. She pushed the strap of her dress off of her shoulder in case he had mistaken the invitation. He hadn't. I can't touch you. She squirmed. I wish you would. You have a death wish? He challenged. 
Cassie bit her lip and felt herself involuntarily clench at the suggestion. <sighs> you have no idea. He rested his elbows on his knees and leaned forward to inspect her, as if seeing some new life form for the first time. When he spoke again a long moment later, his voice washed over her like water. It felt just like the waves of Lake Superior licking her feet, her legs soaking her through and pulling her into the unknown depths. Why do you want to die? I don't, she shook her head. It's not that, I don't, I just... I want you. He held her gaze with an unflinching stare. Andy's eyes were blue, but this was something more. It was the stark, crushing beauty of a truly clear, black night. Eternal. Fathomless. Terrifying. She pushed the strap off her other shoulder and let her dress pool around her waist. He blinked first. Me, he repeated. That's a new one. Bullshit. Slowly, he dissolved into a shadow in the shape of a man. The darkness gathered like fog and rolled over the hills and plains of her body. She relaxed into her mattress with a sigh. When she opened her eyes, he was lying beside her. She reached for him, but instead of touching the man, her hand only disturbed a wall of smoke, sending black plumes curling into the ceiling. You touched me before, at work, she pointed out. Can you do it again? You died for a minute. I only caught you as you fell. And tonight? She turned onto her side to face him, and again she thought of Marissa spraying Andy's cologne on her pillows. This man smelled so much better. Now that he was near, she could pick out frankincense, wax, and ten kinds of flowers. He smelled like a church. Hell, he smelled like a funeral. You were close, he replied. Closer than a woman ought to be at your age. Don't you find that peculiar? Yes, it was very peculiar. The only people she had met who had stopped breathing randomly in the night had sleep apnea. She had always thought the only people who got it were severely obese, but apparently not. Sleep apnea, she dismissed. No, he whispered. Dark smoke swirled around her fingers as she tried again to touch him. Please, she begged, and even she could hear the whine in her voice. Not yet promised with some regret soon soon maybe it was wishful thinking but he sounded every bit as disappointed as she was I went on a date tonight he gave no indication he was surprised you don't care no his voice was a breeze as he faded from view I know you're mine The elevator gaped like an open mouth at the end of the hall. Even from the pod, Cassie could see her reflection in the mirror inside. She looked small and insignificant, a hint of a head above a desk at standing height. She could almost see the circles beneath her eyes at twenty paces. Swish. Pop, 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 pop. The elevator returned to the sub-basement, where it would wait like a dog in a kennel until it returned, uncalled, to flash her reflection at her again. Tick. If the circles under her eyes were noticeable, Marissa's were far worse. She had worked the weekend looking after Mr. Schmidt, who had come down with a mysterious illness no one could figure out but seemed to require constant surveillance. Marissa had taken a special interest in him and had only gone home to sleep for six hours in the past 48, a fact she had only mentioned about 600 times. Marissa returned to the pod, the keys to the medication cupboard dangling from a plastic bungee around her wrist. She slumped into her chair clearly exhausted. How's he doing? She blinked slowly, as if moments from falling asleep. He's not great. His fever keeps coming and going, and he's having trouble making it to the toilet. He has some cyanosis, too. Cassie frowned. I've never heard of a fever coming and going. A line appeared between Marissa's eyebrows. It must be the meds helping him fight it. 
Must be. Cassie pulled up his chart and clicked on his meds list. Hey, uh, would you do me a favor quick? Cassie looked up, distracted. He's on his last set of sheets and the laundry won't be back until morning. Would you run downstairs and grab another set in case he needs them? Cassie's blood ran cold. Downstairs? Yeah, you know where they are. Marissa yawned. <sighs> or I guess I can get them later. I'm, I'm just so tired because I've been sitting up with Mr. Schmidt since Saturday. In three days, I've only gotten to sleep for six hours. Cassie nodded. It's fine, I got it. Thank you. Marissa stretched the words into five or more syllables and returned to the latest issue of People. Don't mention it. Cassie's hair stood on end before she even left her chair. There's only one way down to the sub-basement from their floor, and she always avoided it. Her heart beat so hard she swayed on her feet, and the room began to spin as it had when she had stopped breathing. Suck it up, Cassie. It's just a freaking elevator. She muttered to herself and jabbed at the button before she could chicken out. The elevator leapt to life and groaned as it climbed the cables inch by inch. The doors opened, and again, Cassie found herself staring into her own reflection, but the circles under her eyes seemed deeper this time. She stepped inside and pushed the button. The doors closed. There was nothing obviously frightening about the elevator itself. Its thin blue walls rattled as it descended to the lower floor. It was well lit, warm, and clean as any elevator in a medical facility should be. Why was she afraid of it? Cassie shifted from foot to foot until the doors opened again, and she all but threw herself out of it. She flipped the switch on the wall, and the fluorescent lights along the ceiling flickered to life, lighting her way to the overflow linen closet. They rarely had to use it, but so many residents had been having extra issues lately, they had completely run out upstairs. She pulled three sets of sheets off the shelf, revealing a faded line staining the cement wall. That line was all that was left from the flood of 77. The flood had destroyed every basement in town and several of the houses. The river had burst and flooded the nursing home too, taking the kitchen and most of their medical equipment with it. It had happened ten years before Cassie was born, but it lived on in local legend. The light bulb above her head dimmed. It was about to burn out. Cassie clutched the sheets to her chest and ran to the elevator. She punched the button and it opened immediately. Inside, she sighed in relief as the doors closed in front of her. Shit, she cursed. I forgot to turn the lights off. The elevator climbed slowly, creaking like old bones in the cold. She wouldn't go back down. She didn't have to. The janitors would be in at eight and they could turn off the damn lights. A heaviness fell over her like a cold blanket. The air grew thick and her throat seemed to swell as if her ear had been cut off. Panicking, she glanced toward the vent in the ceiling. It did appear to be open, but there was no maintenance hatch in case the elevator got stuck. Whose genius idea had that been? Her ears popped and she felt her blood pounding through her veins. Would this elevator ride ever be over? When the doors finally opened, she could have sobbed in relief. She darted into the hallway, gasping for breath. Marissa frowned at her from the pod. You okay? Cassie piled the sheets onto the desk. I'm fine. Asthma attack or something. Smoking will do that. Marissa yawned, bored. Whew. Do you have an inhaler? Cassie shook her head. No, I've never been diagnosed. It must be new. Marissa waved the key to the medicine cupboard at her. Grab one out of the store if you want. Try Spriva. That's the good stuff. Cassie blinked at her. Marissa looked up from her magazine, alarmed. Kidding! She pulled the bungee back down around her wrist. Maybe you should see a doctor. <laughs> yeah. Cassie sat down and dropped her face into her hands, comforted by the familiar sight of her keyboard and post-it notes. Nothing scary about charts. They were as mundane as could be. It sounds stupid, but the, um... The elevator creeps me out. Oh, don't worry, sweetie. Ghosts aren't real. Tick. Tick. Cassie let out the breath she was holding. What do you mean? 
Marissa waved a hand. Oh, that crap about the elevator being haunted. Those people just went to heaven like everybody else. Why would God let them hang around this place for all eternity? Tick. Tick. People, Cassie repeated dumbly. What people? Marissa folded the magazine on her lap, her face bright with glee. You don't know the story? How long have you worked here? What story? Marissa leaned in as though she was about to divulge a particularly good secret. Back in the 70s, when the basement flooded, the elevator got stuck down there. There was a janitor, a nurse, and a resident inside it. Again, Cassie felt like her lungs were about to burst. She gasped for air. They drowned? Marissa shrugged. Well, no one knew they were down there, so they didn't call 911 until it was too late. In any case, it took two days to get the elevator working well enough to get them out again. Cassie's stomach twisted, and nausea overtook her. She doubled over, grabbing her little trash can in case she needed to vomit into it. Holding it between her ankles, she stared at the folds of the plastic and concentrated on taking deep breaths until the feeling passed. Uh, you pregnant or something? Cassie almost laughed. Had to get laid to get pregnant. No, uh, just nauseous. That's a really disturbing story. Not really, Marissa argued gently. They're in a better place. Everyone here should be so lucky. There's nothing lucky about drowning in an elevator. Marissa shrugged. They're gonna go anyway, it doesn't matter how. Most of them are DNR. Better just end it than linger here for 20 years with no visitors. What kind of a life is that? Cassie didn't have an answer for her. They all have little things they enjoy. Mr. Green has his crosswords and his cookies, and Mrs. Hart watches Sons of Anarchy all day. I don't think they're unhappy. So sad, Marissa pursed her lips. If I make it to 80, I pray some kind soul will just put me out of my misery. That was an oddly morbid statement coming from her. Cassie was the one with the undead... dead? boyfriend. Marissa had always seemed so... She rose and stretched, happy as could be. I'd better go check on Mr. Schmidt again. I want to be there in case he needs me. She'd always seemed so good. Cassie watched Marissa as she walked away, the key to the medicine cupboard jingling at her wrist. A possibility she hadn't considered sprung to mind. Could their drug thief be hiding in plain sight in pink scrubs and crocs? Once Marissa turned the corner, Cassie scooted along the desk to peek into her charts. Mr. Schmitz was right on top. She flipped through it, past days of neat notes to end it to his medication log. Duonebs, Brioelipta, Lovinox, Lasix. So far, so normal. He'd been a lifelong smoker and had emphysema and early-stage congestive heart failure, both of which were successfully managed by his pulmonologist. He had dyspnea and trace edema, but nothing serious, nothing that could explain his bizarre symptoms. It had to be a virus. Then she saw it. Fentanyl. Mr. Schmidt didn't have cancer or chronic pain. Why would he be on fentanyl? Closing his chart, Cassie rolled back to her computer and pulled up his records. His doctor didn't mention it in his notes and there was no order for it on file. Marissa. The missing meds had been under their noses all along. She was stealing it and giving it to the residents. They're in a better place, she'd said. Shit. Cassie didn't disagree after what she had seen, but that didn't give Marissa the right to speed up their departures. She stared down the hall where Marissa had gone, frozen with indecision. If she was with Mr. Schmidt, he might be in danger now. Hell, she and Cassie were the only people working all night. Cassie couldn't confront her outright. If her sus suspicions were right, God only knew what Marissa would do. Don't be ridiculous, Cassie muttered to herself. She had worked with Marissa for seven years. People didn't just become serial killers overnight. Did they? Before she could talk herself out of it, Cassie scribbled a note to Linda. Check Marissa's charts. Mr. Schmidt is getting fentanyl he doesn't have an order for. The jingling of keys echoed down the hallway. 
Cassie folded the note and shoved it into the pocket of her scrubs. Marissa sunk back into her seat with a satisfied smile. Uh, how is he? Cassie asked. Sleeping, finally, Marissa sighed. Poor dear, he's not long for this world. Cassie swallowed and glanced at the clock. It was 4.45. Linda would start in four hours. As long as he survived the night and Linda got the note, someone could review his meds in the morning. Either she'd be crazy, or she'd save his life. She was probably crazy. Making a false accusation would ruin her relationship with Marissa and might endanger her job. But if there's any chance she was right, it was worth it. Maybe I should go check on him, Cassie offered. He's fine, Marissa snapped and smiled sweetly. Isn't it time for your break? She nodded toward Cassie's Slytherin cup. Down the hallway, the elevator door opened and a tall, dark man stepped out. He held her gaze as he passed the desk and headed for the side door. Cassie sighed. He was back. You know it is. She grabbed the cup and slung her purse over her shoulder. She could feel the note in her pocket, stiff and square against her hip. Linda's office was only two doors down from the break room. I'll be back in 15 minutes. Heart racing, Cassie charged into the break room and got her daily due out of the pot machine. It was so quiet at night that Marissa could hear it from the pod, and she didn't want her to suspect anything was off. She poured it into her cup and chucked the can into the recycling. The clash of aluminum echoed down the empty hall. Marissa was still at her desk. Cassie could see her blurry reflection in the elevator door. Seizing her chance, she ducked into Linda's unlocked office and tucked the note under her mouse so it was the first thing she would notice in the morning. She still wasn't sure it was a good idea to report her suspicions, but if she was right and hadn't at least tried to stop it, she'd never be able to forgive herself. Hands shaking, she downed her pop in a few big gulps. She didn't often drink, but tonight she wished there was vodka in it. She pulled a cigarette out of the pack with her teeth and lit it the moment she stepped outside. He was waiting for her. He sat against the wall, his long legs stretched across the porch. You got one of those for me? She passed him the one she just lit and took another for herself. He smoked it with a bemused smile, menacing figures dancing in the smoke and the frozen vapor of his breath. Is this what it feels like to kiss you? Don't laugh at me. Why can I see your breath? Who's laughing? He smiled. You can see my breath because it's eight degrees out here. You breathe? He shrugged. Everyone breathes. If you can see me, I'm not surprised you can see it. Nothing about you surprises me anymore. She sat down beside him. I just heard about the elevator. He stared at the river, subdued. Did you come for them, too? I come for everybody. She swallowed, her throat feeling oddly dry in spite of the pop she'd just finished. Did your sweater get wet? I don't always wear it. I appear differently to different people, depending on what they expect. He held her gaze, the smile falling from his eyes. How are you feeling? She swallowed again her heart fluttering at his proximity. My head's spinning like a tilt-a-whirl. I think I just figured out why you've been here so often. He raised his eyebrows. Have you? As she nodded, her head felt oddly disconnected from her body, as if it was a balloon tethered to the rest of her by a string. She was so tired. Only two more hours and she'd get to go to sleep. Miranda's poisoning the residents with the missing fentanyl. He nodded. How are you feeling? Nervous, she confessed, emitting a broken laugh. I'm afraid I'm wrong. I'm so worried about it I can't seem to get my breath under control. Relax. His voice was a caress, and her body seemed to obey him. Her breathing slowed, and a delicious heaviness spread through every inch of her body, the way it did when she was just about to fall asleep. She couldn't even feel the cold. 
All she wanted to do was crawl into his lap and take a nap. As a compromise, she let her head drop against the wall. You look sad tonight. He looked down at his hands with a self-conscious smile. I'll miss you as all. Now that I figured it out, you won't be around as much. He didn't reply. He looked oddly vulnerable for an entity as old as life itself. His hair hung in his eyes, his expression sullen and introspective. Will I see you? You know, when I die? Yes. That could be a long time, she said, her heart breaking. More than that, it twitched like a fish out of water. She pressed a hand to her chest, urging it to even out. What about after? Can we see each other? He shook his head. My job is to get you where you're going. Once you get there, you won't see me again. Tears froze in her eyelashes. No, no, that can't be right. I want to be with you. Don't you ever get lonely? He looked at her with more pain than she'd felt in a lifetime, and she had her answer. What if you just don't take me there? Can I stay with you? Help you do your thing? He laughed under his breath. You don't want to be trapped between worlds. But I do, she protested, eyelids getting heavier. I want to be wherever you are. I'll do whatever I have to, please. Tell me you want me. I want you, he admitted. His voice was so low she barely heard it, but she could feel it in her heart and in her bones. It came from every direction as if the night itself had whispered it, a confession in the wind, painted in the sky. She was so gratified to know it, she felt weightless. It felt like she'd been waiting to hear him say that all of her life. I'll wait for you. You won't have to wait long, he consoled. What are the symptoms of fentanyl poisoning? She frowned, taken aback by the question. Um, fatigue, nausea, confusion, difficulty breathing, cardiac arrhythmia, difficulty or inability to swallow... Her mouth was so dry it felt like sandpaper, overcome with a terrible dread. She tried to swallow and couldn't. Hallucination? <laughs> she sobbed bitterly as she realized she was dying. Did I imagine you? He shook his head. No. You're here for me. Her voice cracked. When I saw heaven, was that real? That wasn't heaven, he said. That was just the way there, the train. <sighs> because it looks like a tunnel, she smiled to herself, as sleep settled into her lungs. Somewhere in the distance, she could hear a cello tuning up. I'm so tired, he sighed. It won't take long to get there. No, she shook her head. No, I don't want it. I'll stay here if I have to and wait for you to come back. Anything is better than not seeing you again. His eyes shined like moonlight on the river. Does death cry? She asked him. Not often. <laughs> he blinked rapidly. But if Leonard Cohen says so, it must be true. She smiled, and even that took effort. I love that song. You'll like heaven. They have all the best musicians. She shook her head. No, I don't, I don't want it. I just want you. You'd give up heaven. For me. You're all the heaven I need, she said, meaning it. I want to touch you so badly. Would you hold me for a minute? Please. He opened his arms to her at last, and she sobbed in relief. Her heart had stopped flipping, her throat felt more normal, and the exhaustion was evaporating. She climbed onto his lap, and he wrapped her up in his coat, the end of his nose touching hers. He felt like a living man might, but charged with electricity, 
an almost perceptible power surging beneath his skin. He kissed her. It wasn't a spark, but an explosion, she felt as his lips touched hers. That electricity flowed through her until she felt like she could fly. There was no tunnel this time, no external universe. The universe was inside him, inside her, and she felt connected to each and every living creature in it. It felt like the sun itself burned in her chest. She was positively incandescent. His kiss was a burst of pure light. It felt like recognition. It felt like peace. It felt like eternity. When she opened her eyes, the sun had come up, its rays bursting through the barren black branches that separated the nursing home from the river. There was no tunnel or stars, but she could still hear that cello playing in the distance. He was still there, too. Did that happen? She asked him. Are you real? He kissed her again. I should be asking you the same thing. Let's get out of here. He stood first, offering his hand to help her up. She took it and followed him out into the parking lot. As they turned the corner, they were greeted by the flashing blue lights of three cop cars, an ambulance, and a fire truck. How much time had passed? A dozen or more people milled around as paramedics covered a body on the gurney. Linda was talking to a cop outside the front door, but Cassie couldn't hear what she was saying. They sidestepped the gurney as it rolled in front of them, the paramedics completely oblivious to their presence. Cassie watched it go by with detached curiosity, recognizing her own shoe poking out from the bag. He squeezed her hand and led her through the chaos. She followed, only stumbling as a scream split the air. Looking just like an action figure in his uniform, Andy from 2A escorted Marissa out of the front door in handcuffs. Her eyes were wild and red, and she kept screaming, It was her! It was her! She did this! It was her! Andy all but threw Marissa into the back of the squad car and shut the door. He ran a hand over his face, looking about ten years older than he had on their date. Another cop approached, her Slytherin cup in an evidence bag hanging from his fist. Cassie took one last look at the nursing home and the people she had known. She smiled and turned away. So where are we going? Fifth Street, he replied. There's going to be a traffic accident on the corner in three minutes. She grinned. Behind her, a paramedic called out to Andy. Sorensen, there's something in her hand. What is it? He held up the key ring with the purple bungee. It looks like... Keys. If you guys have made it this far, thank you so very much for listening. I, uh, I hope you enjoyed that story. Happy Halloween.